Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Amy Wiseman, Assistant Director for the UI Center for Human Rights and an Assistant Professor of Instruction in the College of Law, teaching in the Certificate in Human Rights Program. This year, the Center is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Throughout our history, the Center has been dedicated to educating the campus and broader community about human rights and to exploring and developing in partnership with our community, concrete solutions to the most pressing challenges we face locally and globally. Our current webinar series, Industrial Agriculture Impacts Advocacy and Community, continues this important work and explores the intersection of human rights and the environment. Today's webinar, Agricultural Workers and Extreme Heat, OSHA's Proposed Heat Safety Rule, is the third and final in the series. The Center is delighted to partner with the Hubble Environmental Law Initiative to present this webinar series, and we are honored as well to partner with the UI Labor Center on today's webinar. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Paul Iverson, who will in turn introduce the panelists and moderate today's discussion. Paul joined the Labor Center staff as a labor educator in January 2011. He teaches on a range of subjects and has particular expertise in labor and employment law, contract administration and enforcement, labor arbitration, occupational health and safety, and building and construction trades issues. Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. Um, as Amy says, I'm Paul Iverson, a labor educator at the University of Iowa Labor Center. Uh, since 1951, the Labor Center has provided research and education to Iowa's workers and their organizations. We're part of the University of Iowa College of Law as the Center for Human Rights is. Um, one role we play is to link Iowa's workers to the university's resources and to other organizations uh, in the community to help in addressing important issues that affect Iowa workers. We work with the Center for Human Rights, the Hubble Environmental Law Initiative, the Iowa Blue-Green Alliance, the Iowa Federation of Labor, and others in helping to address environmental issues and the effects of the environment on workers. Of particular relevance to today's topic, the Labor Center has been awarded a Susan B. Harwood training grant by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration for the coming year to provide free workshops to workers about the dangers of extreme temperatures and how workers and employers can work together to allow workers to work safely in those extreme temperatures. Those free workshops will be available through September 30th, 2025. And if anybody that is uh, listening to this webinar is interested in host hosting such a free workshop, um, you can contact the Labor Center uh, uh, and the contact information is on the, the uh, advertisement for this webinar. As part of the webinar series on industrial agriculture, we believe it's important to address issues faced by workers in the industry. We all know that temperatures have been increasing across the United States and throughout the world. These environmental changes are felt most profoundly by the workers who have to work in those environments. And the most vulnerable workers are usually the ones that are most profoundly affected. Workers who work outdoors, such as construction workers, agricultural workers, utility workers, and others are obviously affected uh, by the high heat and humidity that has become more prevalent. But those working indoors are also affected as rising temperatures um, make it more difficult to cool indoor spaces adequately and require workers to work under more extreme conditions than in the past. As the Labor Center it provides education to workers all across the state and across all industries, extreme heat is an ever-increasing issue for all of the uh, workers for whom we provide education. In this webinar, we're gonna focus on the effects of extreme heat on agricultural workers and the heat standard proposed by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, after the results of last week's election, we have to acknowledge that the incoming administration is not likely to be supportive uh, of 
this standard, but worker advocates will continue to push for heat standards and for making uh, workplaces safe for workers in extreme heat. Um, and the struggles and research that went into drafting the standard are still relevant uh, to those trying to address heat safety at a state, local, or individual employer level. So to help us understand the dangers of extreme heat for agricultural workers and the ways in which those dangers can be addressed, we have an excellent panel to provide their expertise and perspective on these issues. The panel includes Debbie Berkowitz, Berkowitz from the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Poor at Georgetown University. Debbie Berkowitz is a worker safety and health policy expert and advocate. Before coming to the Kalmanovitz Initiative, she was the worker safety and health program director at the National Employment Law Project for six years, where she worked with national and state partners to develop successful policies and campaigns that improved conditions for vulnerable low-wage workers in dangerous industries, including temporary workers and those in meat, poultry, and the food industry. Most recently, she helped lead campaigns for strong federal and state standards to protect workers from COVID-19. She's a nationally recognized expert on worker safety issues and the author of widely cited reports and research on model policies to improve worker safety and workers' compensation systems. Her past positions include serving as chief of staff and then senior policy advisor for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration from 2009 to 2015. And she was also health and safety director of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union and health and safety director of the Food and Allied Services tr uh, Trade Department of the AFL-CIO. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the American Public Health Association's Alice Hamilton Award. Uh, next on the panel is Amanda Villa from the UFW Foundation. Amanda Villa is the Michigan State Director of the UFW Foundation, bringing a deep understanding of farm worker issues and advocacy to the role. She's passionate about improving the lives of agricultural workers and their families, since she comes from a farm worker family herself. Amanda works to promote worker rights, access to education and knowledge, and community resources, ensuring that farm workers are empowered and heard. Her commitment to social justice and equity drives her efforts to uplift the voices of those in the agricultural community. And finally, Lorraine Gaynor, uh, an assistant professor of legal analysis, writing and research at the University of Iowa College of Law. Lorraine Gaynor is a 2011 graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law, who joined the faculty as an assistant professor of legal analysis, writing and research in 2024. Prior to Iowa law, Gaynor was a senior staff attorney for Iowa Legal Aid, a nonprofit organization that provides legal assistance and education to low income and vulnerable Iowans, where she worked on the Farm Worker Rights Project. From 2011 to 2013, Gaynor served in the U.S. Attorney General's Honors Program as a judicial law clerk and attorney advisor in the Executive Office for Immigration Review, a unit of the U.S. Department of Justice. So thank you panelists for sharing your expertise and your perspective with us. Uh, let's start with Debbie Berkowitz. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, I'm going to give you an overview uh, of uh, heat and why this is something workers need protection from and sort of give you a summary of where we are about in protecting farm workers from heat. So as many of you may know already from this is the third webinar in the series, Agriculture is one of the most dangerous industries. Um, and one of the dangers that agriculture workers face um, is excessive heat. And often those deaths of agriculture workers from excessive heat comes on a worker's first or, or second day on the job. And the truth is it's all preventable. 
So in the United States during the last um, three years for which the government reports data, and it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics that gathers the data on work-related fatalities and illnesses, there was an average of 45 work-related deaths due to exposure to heat at work per year. Exposure to heat also causes serious illnesses such as heat exhaustion and heat stroke that can land you in the hospital. And the number of work-related heat illnesses for workers involving lost time, so those are the most serious heat illnesses, it's about 3,400 a year for the past three years for workers nationwide. And new research demonstrates that these numbers of deaths and illnesses are really an undercount, but it gives you a sense of the extent of the problem. And it probably is not a surprise to all of you that America's lowest paid workers have five times as many heat related injuries and illnesses as its highest paid workers. These include agriculture workers among the workers with the highest incidence of heat related deaths and serious illness. The thing about heat and outdoor workers like agriculture workers is it's not rocket science to protect them. You don't have to do a lot of um, wearing fancy equipment or get um, certain tests done of chemicals that have to be processed in a lab. Protecting workers from heat isn't rocket science. It's imp implementing basic common sense precautions of providing water when it's hot to make sure workers hydrate uh, giving them the chance to rest if they get overheated in a shaded area, and so something called acclimatization, which is really important, which is about acclimating the body to heat. If you haven't sort of worked in heat before, you must do that. Um, and uh, training workers on the signs and symptoms of heat-related illness, because it's nausea, it's other things that you may think is something else, um, and then you don't recognize it. And you may ask like, oh, these are just common sense precautions. Why doesn't every you know, farm, every agriculture employer just put this in place right away? Like, what's the deal here? Um, and I think there's a couple of things to, that you need to understand about farm workers and agriculture workers, um, and actually most uh, uh, industries um, in the agriculture field. Um, and, and that is that um, employers uh, have the, uh, they decide where workers should work, how workers should work, when they should take breaks, if they should be allowed to have water, if they should be what they should be educated on and employers decide that workers don't have the agency to come in and say listen uh i want to start my job 20 percent today and 20 percent tomorrow or 40 percent tomorrow because i need to acclimate my body to um come uh to work in heat um you know they don't have the agency to do that they you know if they said that to the employer the employer would say oh great you're fired um, and workers really have no, um, you know, it may be on paper, but they don't really have a right to refuse hazardous work without retaliation. So, you know, um, why don't employers put in these common sense policies? Um, I don't know. And you can see them up there on your screen. This is a, um, fact sheet on OSHA's website that, um, you see the first thing there, it says ease into work. Nearly three out of four fatalities from heat illness happen during the first week of work. Um, so, you know, OSHA um, is the government agency that's, that um, regulates and requires employers to provide a safe workplace. And um, they, this past um, summer, they issued a regulation, a proposed regulation, so it's not final, and they put it out for public comment um, on a standard uh, to protect uh, workers um, from heat. And what are the requirements? The requirements are sort of what you see right here. And that is the, at a what's called a heat index, which is a measure of temperature plus humidity of 80 degrees, employers have to provide water, at least one uh, enough water for one cup every 20 minutes. Um, they have to provide um 
an area where people can take rest breaks if needed, if they get overheated and that's shaded. They have to provide training to workers on the symptoms of, of injuries, of heat illness, and why you need water rest shade. Um, because so many workers um, exposed to heat die or get sick on the first thing on the job. One of the most important steps that this standard would require is that workers who are new to working in heat gradually assume all the duties, all their duties over a week. There was just a story in ProPublica uh, just published this week about a farm worker who came from Mexico, and you'll hear more about farm workers coming on these visas called H-2A visas for seasonal workers. It was his first day on the job. He had just come from Mexico. He decided to come to the United States because he has a son with, um, with real disabilities and they needed more money. And um, he went to work first day on his job and it was I think September 13th or 14th last year um, and um, he died. And OSHA found that the employer hadn't put in um, protections from heat, the basic things you you see here. Um, if you could sort of move this up, Paul, the, until it says first aid for heat illness, so people can see what the symptoms of heat-related illness are, um, abnormal thinking, slurred speech, seizures, loss of consciousness. If you could move this up even a little bit more, you'll see if a worker experienced headache or nausea, these are uh, elevated body temperatures. These are the first signs of heat-related stress when you um, that workers need to be trained on. And the other thing that the standard, uh, the proposed standard, did is if the temperature, if the heat index was over ninety degrees, then workers had to get a paid fifteen-minute break um, every two hours. And there would have to be a buddy system. Okay, you can take that off, Paul, right now. And then uh, including a buddy system to keep track of, of each other, because especially for farm workers, if they're working alone and all of a sudden they get dizzy or sick and there's nobody there, they can just pass out and die. So this standard um, uh, was OSHA started working on it in 2021, sort of right at the beginning of the um, Biden administration. And it took three years for them to propose the standard. And I actually, um, we have a chart as I'm talking to you of how long and how many steps OSHA has to go through um, to um, uh, 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 write a standard. And I think they just put the link in the chat if you want to go to it, but it is a multi-step process and it takes OSHA between seven and 15 years usually to write a regulation. So when you hear a government agency is like over-regulating, I, I don't, it's not based on fact. Um, so OSHA had to first get the input from small businesses and small farms and small construction sites. And this is a standard that covers indoor and outdoor workers, not just agriculture workers. Um, and they have to gather all this data and they have to go to work sites. And so they finally published this proposed rule in um, July of this year. And they gave people uh, time to comment on it until uh, the end of December. Um, and then after that, OSHA would then, um, they legally have to review all the comments. They have to analyze them. They have to respond to them. That usually takes between six months and a year. Um, and then they have to make any changes to the proposed standard based on those comments. They could even hold public hearings if they wanted to. And that takes another year. And then they finally write a final uh, rule. But because elections have consequences, like huge consequences here, um, under the Trump administration, the first Trump administration, they didn't do any work on any rulemaking, including heat, where we, during the Obama administration, they were about to start work on the, a proposal to protect workers from excessive heat. There was no work on it done at all under the Trump administration. And instead, the Trump administration spent their time trying to repeal uh, rules that had been in place. And I just want you to know that OSHA is a very small agency. It doesn't have a lot of staff to write rules. It can only really write one at a time. But also, 
they have very, they don't have a lot of inspectors. It would take OSHA 160 years to inspect every workplace just once. And um, so what's going to happen now um, since the past is prologue is um, the new incoming administration can't, will try to either withdraw their proposal or just completely stop work on it. Um, you know, this is a very anti-regulation new administration that is coming in um, and it will shut down any work on this. And it also will reduce enforcement like they did during their first time to the lowest levels in the history of the agency. Um, so this is all sad for workers, but um, states can move forward and, and regulate heat. Um, Iowa has its own OSHA. They could issue uh, uh, protections for water, rest, shade, acclimatization, and training, and things like this. Uh, California did for agriculture workers and and outdoor construction workers 15 years ago. That standard has been in place for 15 years, showing it's very feasible to do, and it protects workers. Um, Maryland just issued a standard, the state of Maryland, for protecting outdoor and indoor workers with those same protections I just read to you. Um, a little different, you know, every state has a little bit different, but basically the same water, rest, shade, acclimatization, training, buddy system, emergency response, um, 80 and 90 degrees are the heat triggers. Oregon also did the same thing. Um, and Colorado passed a special uh, regulation to protect agriculture workers from heat. Um, so, you know, there are things that people can do. I also, if you want to comment on the current standard and why it's important, I think they're going to put in the chat the um, uh, website to go to. Um, and you can advocate here in Iowa for them to put in some kind of protections. I want you to know that even without the standard, that employers have a general responsibility under the OSHA law to provide a safe workplace. But without a specific standard, with specific requirements, it's very hard for workers to advocate and say, listen, the law says I have to get water, rest, and shade, um, and I'm acclimatization. But um, if uh, you know there's no specific standard, there's just a general obligation. And also it impacts how OSHA can enforce. Usually they don't enforce or, or fine uh, farms for not implementing heat protection until without a standard until somebody dies or somebody gets very sick. But with a standard, then they, you know, that's all about preventing somebody from getting sick or dying. So I think we're gonna, you know, unfortunately with this rollback, it's too bad because agricultural workers really do need these protections from heat. Um, so thank you, and I'll answer any questions you have uh, at the end of the program. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and now to we'll, we'll move on to uh, the farm worker perspective. Uh, you know what what uh, the 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 effects of of heat on the farm workers themselves. So uh, Amanda, will you take it from here? Thank you. Um, hello everyone, Amanda with the UFW Foundation. The UFW Foundation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of farm workers, immigrants, and Latinos through legislative advocacy, community outreach, and organizing. Um, today I'm gonna bring forth the farm worker voice. Wherever we go, wherever we speak, in the places and spaces that we're in, we always try to um, uplift the farm worker because it's a vulnerable community. And I want you to visualize a farm worker before I go into um, talking about heat protection and um, the causes of untreated heat um, exposure. So I want you to visualize the farm worker. Uh, four out of five farm workers are Hispanic or Latino. Income range um, usually is less than 25,000 a year. Um, some farm workers in some areas have suffered food insecurities and often rely on food emergency programs to feed their own families. I'm gonna say that again because sometimes, I, I feel like sometimes we have to hear it twice. The individuals that pick our own food, that harvest our own um, food, sometimes face food insecurities themselves. Um, Three quarters of the nation's 2.4 million farm workers are immigrants, and more than half 
of those um, 2.4 million farm workers are undocumented um, or are on um, work visas. Um, he is a leading weather cost killer for farm workers and it's becoming dangerous every day. We see climate change all the time. We see these um, storms, these heat raves, um, just the weather um, is just getting more extreme. And um, as a community, as a nation, we need to do something about it in order to protect the, uh, the people that feed us, the people that work on the farms. Um, our farm worker group um, community is a vulnerable group because again, lack of legal status. And um, sometimes farm workers come from a mixed family status, which um, sometimes parents are undocumented and then they have children which are now documented. Um, so it's, it's a complicated situation for a lot of farm workers. Um, the ag industry is relying more and more on H-2A workers, which is a program that brings foreign workers um, for a specified period of time and for a specific program. Um, H-2A program has a widespread, um, they, they have like wage theft, um, sexual assault, trafficking, and other forms of abuse and exploitation. Um, and also because of the extreme heat, um, sometimes they themselves suffer extreme heat and even death. Like Debbie was mention mentioning um, that farm worker that died in Florida. That's not an isolated case. This happens very often. I feel like one death is too much. Um, here in Michigan last year, um, end of September, we had an individual, uh, he was 31. A 31 year old passed away because of heat exhaustion. Um, and like, again, Debbie mentioned, the, the signs are there. Um, we need basic dignified rules and laws from our employers um, to protect individuals from the heat, um, provide rest breaks, provide shade breaks. These are basic needs for all human um, human individuals. Um, sometimes we don't, a lot of the laws don't cover farm workers because of the status, because of their um, visas, or because we're just, um, we're just not included in laws because, again, majority is because of the lack of legal status, which are often excluded uh, from these laws, which is, um, at the end of the day, it's it's unbearable to hear that someone lost their lives because of a uh, because of the heat. Um, farm workers and construction workers suffer from the highest rates of heat illness, um, and again, it's because of their working conditions. They're usually out in the field, out in the elements. Um, a lot of times, individuals can't take days off when the temperatures are are soaring over 80 or 90 degrees because they have a, a family to feed themselves. Um, and Debbie also mentioned this, um, but this uh, only a very few states have enacted their own heat standards, um, which she mentioned California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Minnesota, and Maryland. Um, but collectively, individually, uh, as a state, we, we have... A, some power to enact these laws um, so that our farm worker community can can be at ease, that they can take a rest break if they need to, um, go to the shade if, if they need to also. Um, and then three out of four deaths happen within the first couple of weeks of um, agriculture work. And that's individuals have to build tolerance. Um, it's like with everything, you can't go to the gym and expect to, to be buffed by the end of the day. You have to build that tolerance. Um, individuals working in heat and harsh conditions also have to have enough time so that their body can acclimate and so that they, their body can get used to these harsh conditions um, um, so that they don't suffer these, these um, catastrophal um, illnesses that could lead to death. Um, the UFW, we are doing our part. Um, it's unfortunate to think that these proposed laws and regulations might come to an end sooner than what we expected. Um, but as a foundation, we we have been submitting comments to support um, these rules, and our organization has been gathering support support from farm workers and um, collecting heat testimonies from from the worker themselves, um, so that. Whenever we could, uh, we could uplift the stories and 
um, share the, the thoughts and the suffering that our farm worker community faces. Um, I always, whenever I, I talk or whenever I'm in a space, I always bring pictures of farm workers because I think um, it's important to see the individuals. It's important to, to get to know the farm worker community. Um, we just ask for basic dignified human laws, which um, they're not too difficult to, to reach. It's having access to water, having access to shade, um, having those breaks when necessary. Um, we're, we just want to make sure that our farm workers are treated with dignity and respect um, because they do so much for our nation. Thank you, Paul. I can answer any questions at the end also. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Amanda, for that uh, valuable perspective. So we've had the sort of the national perspective on, on the, uh, you know, ru rules relating to health and safety, had the farm worker perspective. Um, I want to bring this to Iowa. Um, and so our uh, final speaker on the panel, Lorraine Gaynor, uh, who's going to give us a little, you know, having worked with farm workers through Iowa Legal Aid for a number of years, going to give us a little bit of a perspective on um, how these issues play out in, in the Iowa agricultural industry. So thank you, Lorraine. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for sharing your lunch hour to come um, be part of this conversation. So yeah, at, at Iowa Legal Aid, I worked on the Farm Worker Rights Project um, and we did outreach and community legal education to farm workers across the state of Iowa and also represented farm workers in civil cases related to their job. So um, as you've heard from the other panelists, you know, some of the common legal issues for farm workers were things like wage theft, you know, either not being paid at all for certain pay periods or being paid a lower wage rate than they were promised. Um, or not being paid all of the hours that they worked that week. Um, wage theft is sort of sneaky and can show up in different ways, um, but that, that's a big problem. Um, sexual harassment, discrimination, fraud, breach of contract. So, you know, a lot of farm workers travel thousands of miles um, to come to Iowa, either from, you know, other countries or from, you know, down in the valley in Texas. We have a lot of workers in Iowa who come from the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, towns like Brownsville, McAllen, Mercedes, and they come to Iowa um, based on the promises that they were made at recruitment about what they would be doing and how much they would be paid. And sometimes when they get here, um, you know, the employer doesn't keep those promises. So um, those were some of the, the legal issues too, um, trafficking, forced labor, and then, of course, health and safety issues in their workplaces and um, in their employer-provided housing. Um, I wanted to give you a little sense of Iowa specifically, kind of who are Iowa's farm workers. Um, we we have a lot of a lot of farm workers in Iowa and varied types of jobs. There's both seasonal agricultural work here and year-round work. Um, so some of the year-round types of agricultural work are things like working in dairies. Um, working with hogs in some of the big hog farms, um, working in uh, the egg processing facilities. And then seasonal work, we have planting, harvesting, um, crop work, um, watermelons, vegetable farms, detasseling seed corn, I'm going to talk about in a little bit because there's some very serious health, um, heat related concerns with that, that work, um, just because of the time of year and the nature of being in the corn. Um, seed sorting facilities, working in nurseries and greenhouses. So really, you know, very varied um, agricultural work and, and a range of workers that come to do this job. So there are people um, doing farm work who live in Iowa year round. There are workers who come from Texas and other states and kind of follow the crops through the seasons um, and may stop in Iowa to do a certain season and then move on to other Midwestern states. Um, and then, like you've heard about, we also have um, H-2A workers who come to Iowa who are from other countries, but they come on a, um, a temporary agricultural work visa that their employer sponsors. And so you know, those workers are uniquely vulnerable in that their employer really holds so much power, they, their immigration status, um, their housing, their transportation, you know, is all, all contingent on that visa. So if things are not going well, they can't just like quit and go get another H-2A job. They can only work for that employer that sponsored their visa. 
Um, and you know, a lot of times the the amount of money that they can make on that H two A visa for the season that they're working in Iowa is significantly more than they would be able to make in in their country. And so I think there's also there's a lot of fear of retaliation or fear of not being invited back for the next year. Um, so even when when there are violations of their rights, it can be very scary to speak up and complain, um, and a lot of a lot of fear about that. Um, I I wanted to share a little bit more about detasseling in particular. Um, you know, there may be people on this call who have detasseled. It's you know in the Midwest there is a lot of corn, um, a lot of big seed corn companies. You know, have fields and fields of corn in Indiana, Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois. Um, but detasseling is a pretty short, fast and furious season. It you know usually the work starts around July fourth and goes into August. So it's also um, happening at the sort of the hottest, most humid time of year in the Midwest. Um, and it's extremely hard work. Um, the the machines go through and do a first pass a lot of times down the row of corn, but it's still a type of farm work that um, relies on on human beings, hardworking farm workers to to do um, to walk down the rows of corn and basically remove the tassels from the top. Um, so the workers will grab the tassel, like the top part of the corn plant where the pollen is produced, and they'll pluck that from the rest of the stalk to make sure that the plant is pollinated by corn in adjacent rows rather than by itself. And that's to create like a hybrid um, seed product. Um, so it's extremely, extremely hard work and it's very hot. And you know, I, however hot it is outside on whatever day in July and August, inside the rows of corn too, it, it's even hotter because the humidity gets kind of trapped in there. Um, and workers typically wear long sleeves to do detasseling work to shield their arms from the sharp edges of the corn leaves and also from the sun and from pesticides. Um, the work starts really early in the morning. A lot of times, like at 5.30 or 5, they'll be getting on school buses to be taken from the housing to the fields where they're going to be working. And workers have described that the moisture from the dew on the corn in the morning really builds up on your clothing and making it sort of stick to you like a wetsuit so that when the sun comes up, it almost feels like you're boiling alive. I've had clients describe that. Um, so extremely um, hot work and uh, you know very, very high risk in terms of the concerns we're talking about today with heat exhaustion, heat illnesses, dehydration. Um, and, and there's been very, very sad um, situations with the tasseling. I mean, in 2018 in Grand Island, Nebraska, um, a worker named Cruz Urias Beltran was um, died in his third day of work. And you heard Debbie and Amanda talk about this, the, the importance of having time to acclimate. Um, but he was 52 years old. It was his third day of, on the job. It was very hot in Grand Island, Nebraska that day. It was at least 94 degrees outside the corn, um, but the heat index was in the triple digits. And he had spent nine hours detasseling corn in sun-baked fields and, and collapsed in, in the corn field and died. And he did not have time to acclimate, um, you know, again, just his third day on the job. And it, I've had workers describe too, walking down those rows of corn is very disoriented too, very disorienting. Um, and, you know, ideally you're working with a buddy, but again, without the federal standard sort of mandating that, it's, you know, workers are really kind of at the mercy of how humane of a boss they have and whether, you know, whether that that crew leader is um, treating them with dignity and cares about them as a human being and is going to let them take breaks, make sure that they're working with somebody. So if they start to show signs of of heat illness or heat exhaustion, um, somebody will notice and help them find their way out of that row of corn. Um, there is a, OSHA has a field sanitation standard that requires um, potable cold drinking water with individual cups um, within a fourth of a mile from where you're working and also like porta potties and hand washing facilities. And so it, with the tasseling, typically employers will bring like porta potties to the fields and you know sometimes have like one of those big sort of Gatorade jugs of water. But again, this is kind of a thing that, you know, I've had clients tell me that um it was it was like a half a mile walk away, you know, so not as close as it was supposed to be. Um and the other the other thing is that. Um, a lot of crop workers and detasslers too, they, they're sometimes paid on what's called a piece rate. So 
um, the pay system is like you'll get paid a certain amount of money per acre detasseled. Um, and this, you know, workers are, are here to make money. They're, they're very hardworking and they want to make as much money as they can. And so, you know, they'll say, well, if I take a break and go get water, I have to walk all the way there, which is going to take time, which means I'll be able to detassel, you know, less corn. Um, and I'll have fewer acres at the end of the day, I'll make less pay. And the more water I drink, I'm gonna have to go to the bathroom more. Um, so there's, you know, there's very real concerns, um, and just sort of the whole way that all this is set up and that it works together, it can make it really hard um, to to for workers to feel like they can take those precautions. Um, and you know, it's, there's there's a lot of things we can work on with all of this. Um, we we partnered a lot with Proteus, which is um, a migrant health organization that does mobile health clinics to farm workers in Iowa, and they put on really great um, heat stress and pesticide trainings that they try to give to workers sort of as part of the onboarding and when they first get here. And so that's that's great. I mean, I think community education um, to make sure workers understand um, how to prevent heat exhaustion and heat illness and um, can try to look out for each other and recognize the signs. Um, but it is, you know, definitely as, as the days get hotter and like Amanda said, you know, this is, it, it's gonna get hotter and hotter every summer. And I know every July when detasseling would start, I would just look at the you know weather every day and just be hoping like that we don't have a heat wave because you know, you know that there are some crew leaders out there that are not that are not doing the right thing and are um cruel, frankly. And um so it's you know, I hope that that we can all do whatever advocacy we can right now. It is a little bit of a depressing um, time to be giving this talk, as as Debbie said. But um, you know, I think the field sanitation standard is still there, and there is that obligation to have the water nearby. Um, and I think as much community education and sort of advocacy at the local level people can do is is great. Um, so that's all I I have. But thank you all so much for for being interested in this topic and listening today. And I think we'll all take questions at the end. Yes, thank you, Lorraine. Um, so let's see, do we have any questions? Um, can I access, this is, this is too much inside baseball. Can I access the questions or do I need to get those from uh, Erica? Let's see, I don't, there are any questions that are showing up on my, screen. Um, so uh, Erica, if you can break in if I'm missing something, but I don't see any open questions. Yes, we invite the audience to submit their questions. There are currently none in the Q&A box. Okay. Um, so we have a little, little bit of time that we had set aside for questions. Um, uh, is for, From our panelists, is there anything that um, uh, you did not have the chance to say, uh, especially Debbie. You seem to uh, uh, there, there seem to be more things that 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 you could have talked about. Is are there things that you would like to add at this point? Since we have a little bit of time at the end, that you that you truncated during your initial remarks. I think one thing that's really important, especially in Iowa, where you have your own state OSHA, is. Um, to really keep their feet to the fire, especially when it comes to agriculture and other low wage workers in this industrial agriculture sector, whether, you know, meat processing, um, CAFOs that you have in the state. I think, um, you know, one of uh, the, the lowest point, I think, of your existing OSHA in Iowa and also federal OSHA was during COVID when. OSHA just turned a blind eye to what was going on into meat plants like in Waterloo and other meat uh, plants. And, um, you know, so um, I think that worker safety in general is going to take a big hit. And, um, you know, whoever's watching, if you're from Iowa, whatever state you are, you're going to want to keep your agency's feet to the fire here. They never do a whole lot, but you don't want them to even do less. And, when it comes to heat, if you, you know, want to talk about why this standard is important, you can submit comments. It's very easy in the Federal Register. You know, the link is 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 there. 
It's uh, OSHA.gov. Uh, is this a backward slash laws slash regs? And um, and submit comments why this is important. You create a record, and then the next administration, the ones to move forward, has this record to use to issue a standard. Thanks, Debbie. And um, Amanda, did you have anything that uh, you would like to add? Just reiterating the basic needs and human digni dignified needs that we as farm workers um, ask for. Um, I think the needs are very simple and at some times like easy, easily to give um, in a utopian world, um, basic like shade, water, rest. That's how um, I think these actions would prevent a lot of deaths. Um, so like locally, what we can do as a state um, to enforce these heat regulations if the nation is not on board, um, we've seen it pass in other states. So we know it's able, we know it's something that we can do um, locally. So what can we do as a community to, to pressure our own state so that they can enact these safety laws um, specifically for heat regulations, which doesn't cost the employer much. Um, H-2A program workers, um, I, I hear a lot of complaints about the increased cost of labor, um, but these are minimal increased cost um, because it doesn't take much to, to provide a rest. It doesn't take much to, to give water breaks. Um, it, you're not going to lose a huge uh, portion of your profits if you give a farm worker or an employee the first two weeks so that they can tolerate the heat. Um, so it's basic basic needs that we need to ask as a community to our local um, and state agencies um, so that collectively we could we can build something stronger even if the whole nation doesn't want to pass a, a universal heat standard. Um, we can do it locally with our state. Um, so just reiterating that um, it's not not much that we ask, it's basic human needs. And I think that's an, a very important point to emphasize is it's not like um, you're even asking, you're, you're asking for anything beyond what basic human dignity would provide, you know, water and a place to go to the bathroom and, but, the time to do that is a big issue. If, you know, what about the sort of peace rate um, pay that where people don't want to take the time um, because that's going to affect how much they're able to make? Yeah, and I know agricultural work is so time sensitive that if we don't pick the zucchini crop within two days, that crop is going to be perishable and it's not going to be market friendly. So we we do understand that, but sometimes we need to look at it as a bigger picture that we're talking about human dignity. Uh, we're not talking about cattle. We're not talking about um, inanimate objects that don't have feelings, that don't have a heart, that don't have life. Like we are talking about human human lives. And I know um, sometimes like the, the harvesting window is small, um, but like the changes don't, don't have to be exaggerated. It could be uh, a simple, um, port a party on a four wheeler and just drag it as people work. I don't know solutions. We could come up with so so many creative solutions, but I feel like we're just closed minded that we've we've been like, no, this is gonna cost too much, so we're not gonna talk about it. We're gonna wait until the government imposes a rule and then we're gonna act on it. So. Yes, even though as as uh, Debbie Berkowitz pointed out, you know there is uh, under OSHA a uh, 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 general duty to provide a safe work environment. Yeah, often when there's not a specific um, uh, specific standard, you know, then employers will, you know, say, prove that I'm not being safe, and it becomes difficult. Um, one question I have is one of the, one of the things that um, the heat standard emphasizes is having cool water. And so I wanted to ask uh, Amanda, you know, is do, do em employers have to provide water as part of the sanitation standards, but um, do you know, is that water 
cool water or the, or does the water get hot during the day um to where it it uh, it it can help to hydrate but not to not to keep you cool it probably provide it probably depends on like the the quality of the employer and if they choose to put the water in a container that's going to maintain it cool all day or if they're going to like replenish it um so it it really depends i am we know like when whenever we go out to the field and and request heat testimonies sometimes we're welcome into the field and sometimes we're not welcome and it really depends on like the quality of employer because again um if there are no labor violations being broken, there is nothing to lose. And if you know that you're treating your farm workers with dignity and respect, then then obviously you would um, open open the doors for any agency just to provide some support or education to your um, labor force. Um, but to be honest, it probably depends on the the container that that it's in. I know, like the Gatorade plastic jugs, those ones they heat up really fast especially if if you're if you don't have any shade to it and if um they're like with the heat of the elements and all that i know the, the water doesn't maintain cool um for the whole period of the farm worker in labor thank you um i see that there is a there is a question from the audience so for this for any of the panelists um do you expect that climate change denial will add another layer of complication uh, to federal regulation or uh, any regulation going forward? And I don't know who would like to address that. Um, the reason OSHA started working on this standard was because Every summer gets hotter and hotter. We've had like in the last three years, some of the hottest summers we've ever had in the United States, in Maryland, where I'm, I live, Baltimore had the hottest summer ever last year. And before that was the hottest summer ever before that. So I think you're going to see temperatures going up and um, and up and up. And, you know, there's one thing to deny climate change, but the facts are the facts and you're gonna see an increase in deaths and an increase in illness. One thing I worry about, keep your eye on this, is uh, when the first Trump administration, they didn't like data, they didn't like statistics. And so they really tried to bury statistics and data. And so we'll see what they try to do here about burying, you know, the facts. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a big um, issue here is you cannot deny that the temperatures are higher and whatever you want to say is, you know, that that's not climate change or that's not human cause, you, whatever the political debate might be, the facts on the ground are that it's getting hotter every year and, 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 uh, and that has to be addressed uh, for workers that are exposed to that. There's also a, a question again for any of the panelists that would like to address it. In addition to heat, uh, what are the potential in, in implications of climate change for agriculture workers? I can talk specifically about farm worker and like um, climate migration. There's a lot of hurricanes and natural disasters that hit our heavy um, producing states like Georgia and Florida that um, after hurricanes hit, um, sometimes the farmer doesn't want to replant their crop. So people have to look for different avenues of income or migrate north um, in order to provide for their family. Um, so those are additional um, challenges that our farm workers face daily climate migration, like um, I don't have work any here in Georgia anymore because of um, Hurricane Helene. So what am I going to do? Am I going to wait it off? I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that the farm worker um, plants or replants their crop and then I have work for next year or do I look for something else or move to a different state that I have agriculture work? Uh, Lorraine, did you have, have something to add? Yeah, just, I I think I totally agree with everything Amanda said, and I think um you know you see other things like flooding in Iowa. We've had 
um, flooding over the years. And, you know, sometimes workers um, taking taking a H-2A contract um, where they come and then they start to work, but then, you know, the fields flood or something like that. And, and there are the H-2A regulations require that the employer pay, um, it's called the three-fourths guarantee. So even if they end up working less, um, than the 100% promised time, they're still supposed to be paid three fourths of the wages they would have earned over that. But there is an exception for like act of God. Um, you know, so I think some of these these things like Amanda was talking about hurricanes and um, flooding and things like that, it, it, it's really hard on, on workers who take the contract and come and are ready to work. And then something like this happens and they, you know, they may not have their three fourths guarantee claim to potentially if it if the employer argues you know act of God, um, and then they they're trying to look for other work and find a, a place to go, but you know you have to pay for the transportation to get there and find the other contracts and all that. So, yeah, definite definite effects. Yes, thank you, Lorraine. Well, what that brings us just about to the end of our time. So, um, I want to thank the panel again uh, for. Um, the, your excellent work providing um, your expertise and perspective on the issues. Um, the issues of extreme heat are not going away. They're going to get worse. Um, and so there are things that we're going to have to address in whatever way uh, we can, whether it is through a federal standard or through other standards or through other worker advocacy. Um, and so I thank everyone for uh, tuning in and, and, and watching this webinar. And I'll turn it over to Amy Wiseman for closing comments. Thank you, Paul. And I'll just echo your thanks for the panelists and to the panelists for sharing, again, their expertise in this very engaging and enlightening conversation on critical issues. Uh, I also want to close by inviting everyone in attendance to join um, us in future events and check out uichr.uiwa.edu to learn more about upcoming programs, including two upcoming in-person programs. The first is on December 4th, featuring Professor Saeed Mohammed, who is a visiting professor of economics at Grinnell College in Iowa through Scholars at Risk. He will share our, his research in a talk titled Intra-Household Autonomy and Demand for Modern Energy Solutions in Low-Income Countries, a Case Study from Ethiopia. For more information, uh, please check out our website. Next up, we have a celebration of Human Rights Day and our 25th anniversary year, featuring our very own Dean Adrian Wing, Associate Dean Adrian Wing, presenting our annual Human Rights Day lecture. All are invited to attend and enjoy a reception afterward. There will be remarks by President Barbara Wilson. Uh, and as you can see from the poster, um, the event occurs 5 to 6 p.m. at the Old Capitol Senate Chamber. Finally, just a reminder that you will be able to find today's program, as well as all of our previous webinars in the series, on the UACHR YouTube channel. You can stay up to date about center programming by joining our mailing list and following us on Facebook, X, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And please consider donating to support our programming. You can find a link to do so at the top of our website. Thank you again for joining us and hope to see you on December 4th and December 10th. <music>